Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for artist, citizen, Detroit resident, Pat Duff. Good evening. He knocked hard on the door to the flower shop, our shop, Byron's Flowers, in 1994. I let him in. But as soon as I did, I felt that there wasn't something quite right about him. I was right. He put a gun to my head. He said, give me your money. Don't look at me. I reached down in my pocket and I pulled out $200 that I had just taken as a deposit on a wedding. Then another man ran in. Just then we heard a big crash from the other side of the shop. My husband had just fallen on the floor reaching for his gun underneath the table. The one man ran over there yelling, hitting him on the head, saying, where's the safe? I said, over here. So he kind of dragged my husband over to the other side, went to the safe, said, open it. My husband, Nat, bent down. He toyed with the combination, but he couldn't get it open. He tried a couple of times. I remember thinking, He's been having memory problems lately. I said, I'll do it. So I opened the safe. After they took everything out, put it on the floor, they grabbed a thick envelope. They thought it was full of money. It was our bank statement. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really funny, though. They made us lie down on the floor after that. A guy put a gun to my head. I remember thinking as I was laying there, I'm ready to die. I've lived a good life. He pulled the trigger. The bullet jammed in the barrel. Panicking, they dragged both of us to the top of the basement steps, pushed us down all the time yelling, don't come up for 15 minutes. And then they left. While I was on the basement floor, I remember starting to recall my life and thinking about all the gifts that I had received. I was born in 1942 in Detroit on Christmas Day, a gift to my mom. I was delivered at Women's Hospital in Detroit by a black doctor. That was kind of unusual back then. But we were poor, and my mom couldn't afford her own doctor. She was very proud of me. I became her pride and joy. I had red hair, just like her mother. I met Nat in 1957, I was 15 years old, and he was 17. I worked at the Dairy Queen, and he worked at the car wash next door. For some reason, this man, this young boy, ate an awful lot of ice cream. <laughs> and I got so comfortable with him as we began talking over the window of the Dairy Queen, that I would ride through the car wash with him underneath the water, hitting the roofs of the cars. That's where he first kissed me. One day he asked me out. I hadn't been dating. I was so stunned. I just blurted out, oh, I don't date boys. <laughs> 
I go out with men. <laughs> Actually, I was referring to the fact that in junior high school, I had a crush on my art teacher. <laughs> That's probably why I went into art. <laughs> But anyway, he was actually a surrogate father to me. He took uh, me by the hand and found that I was creative and got me to take off in the art world. He was a surrogate father because my own dad was killed in a car accident when I was 12. When Nat and I began dating, he didn't have a car. So, of course, we had to take the bus. But it was strange on that bus. I remember sitting there one day, and I turned around and I said to Matt, why are these people staring at us? And he said, because I'm Negro. You weren't called black back then. And you are white. Yeah. And we're not supposed to be together. And that's how I learned about prejudice. I had no idea. We would take the bus to a local schoolyard and sit underneath the bushes. Sometimes I would bring a blanket. The school was on Livernois and Broad Street. And even today, when I drive by, I have fond memories of that space. It was called Hope Academy. I was still dating Nat when I got to high school. But it became increasingly apparent that it was hard for us to be together. If we were walking down the street, we were harassed and followed. When he started driving, we were constantly pulled over by the police. It got so I would lay down in the car so nobody would see me, and Nat would carry a knife. We were very afraid. I was still dating Nat when I got to high school. I went to Cass Tech. At that <laughs> Yay. At that time, there were only six art students in the whole art department, and probably not many more minorities in the whole school. I made friends with all of them. And my fellow art students thought that highly unusual and thought that I was extremely religious. I was Catholic and they called me Sister Srebensky. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> anyway, I remember one incident in high school. I used to ride the bus with one of my best girlfriends, and we would always talk about our boyfriends. She showed me a picture of her boyfriend one day, and I showed her a picture of Nat. I never saw her again. Yeah. When I was getting ready to graduate, my high school counselor called me in the office and she said, where are you going to college, Pat? I was pretty bright and so she took notice and I said, I can't go to college. My family's too poor. And besides, I have a good paying job at Cunningham Drugstore. <laughs> That was going to be my life. She laughed, and she said, we can do better than that. And she got me a four-year scholarship from a Catholic woman's organization. That was a gift. The scholarship was dependent on a review at the end of each year. And by the fourth year, I got wind of the fact that they had heard the rumor that maybe I was going out with a Negro. They called me in for another interview. 
but I was ready. And they asked me that question, are you? I pulled out a drawing I had done of Nat and said, this young man, he's my model. <laughs> yeah, I lied. When I was uh, in college, after the first year, you know, art students need a lot of money. And the scholarship paid my way, but it didn't really give me enough money for supplies. So I decided that I needed to get a summer job. I had heard that Hudson's in downtown Detroit, you remember them? Yeah, was hiring. So I decided to go down and apply for the job. When I got off the elevator on the 13th floor, there were hundreds of girls for this one position. And I thought, oh no, I'm never gonna get this job. But I applied anyway. And then we all sat out in the auditorium waiting for our, whoever's name was gonna be called. They called mine. I was really shocked. But I was more shocked when I went into the room and the first question they asked me was, how would you feel working with a group of Negro women? Smiling. <laughs> I said, I would have no problem at all. <laughs> By this time, I had been dating Nat for seven years. Yeah. I integrated the elevator staff. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I met my best friend, Evelyn Causer. They had a special lounge for the elevator operators yeah, because they were all Negro, right? And she took me in as a friend and taught me how to play bid whist. <laughs> I had no idea what that was, but... I got to learn, and I did pretty good at it. I loved those sessions. They were a lot of fun. Evelyn came to my wedding. I went to hers. Evelyn babysat all of my children, Natasha, Damien, and Nicole, and I got to know her daughter, Rita. I went to her husband's funeral, and she came to my husband's funeral. We have been married... I'm sorry, we have remained friends for 58 years. Yeah. From college, I received another gift. I was afforded a two-year fellowship to the University of Michigan, where I majored in fine arts, and after two years, got my Master of Fine Arts degree. By this time, Nat wanted to marry me. I mean, after all. <laughs> but I persisted, no, I want to finish my education. And besides, you have to become Catholic. <laughs> so we married in 1965, two years before the riots. But when we went to have our prenuptial conferences, which are required of all Catholics who married in the Catholic Church. The priest called us aside after the first session and said, you two shouldn't get married. In fact, I don't want to marry you. Yeah. But we insisted, and we had married anyway by another priest. My mom didn't tell anybody that I was getting married. None of my family came to my wedding. None of my relatives knew that I had gotten married. My grandmother died not knowing that I was married or even had children. And years later, I was told not to attend her funeral. And even last year, I was told not to go to my aunt's funeral because she didn't like my husband. I had become a disgrace to my mom. I need to go back a little bit. I forgot a very important incident that happened to Nat and I when we were together 
before we got married. It's very important. When I said that we were trying to be alone together, but we were harassed all the time, we decided that we needed to find a place where we could be alone together in peace and enjoy each other's company. So Nat found a place. It was a blind pig. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry I forgot it. That was important. I was only, I, maybe I forgot it on purpose because <laughs> I remember what happened. But anyway, I was only 15 and he was 17. It was great. <laughs> I mean, it had a bar. You know, we, we, we drank. We were minors. It had music. We could dance together and nobody would be staring at us. And there was a little back room where we could go and <clears throat> <laughs> it was great. <laughs> anyway, one night it was raided. Yeah. I was taken to a juvenile detention facility and Nat was arrested. And he was charged with contributing to the delinquency of a white female minor. Yeah, that was the charge. Of course, they had to let him go because he was a minor. <laughs> so I don't know. Anyway, my mom came to the detention facility, and I thought, oh, I'm going home. But I was surprised when she told the social worker don't let her out until she promises never to see that boy again. I resisted their little craft projects they had for me to do as re rehabilitation. I didn't take part in the group conversations. I didn't hear, need to hear what they had to say. But I wasn't getting out. And so being smart, or so I thought, I decided that I would have to lie. And so I told them that I would never see Nat again. And so I, I was let go. Moving forward, after we were married, I remember my mom telling me that she wanted to see our oldest daughter, Natasha, when she was born. I was so excited. Finally, she's going to come around. Finally, she's going to become part of our family. But after looking at her, she told me, I just wanted to make sure that she didn't have black and white stripes. Yes, that's what she said. I was so hurt by that comment. Early in our marriage, Kelly and Company, it was a TV show in Detroit back then. Yeah. They contacted us and they wanted to know if we would do an interview on TV about interracial marriage. I told them no, because I didn't want my family to find out that I was married on TV. Yeah. Of course, all that changed. <laughs> many years later, when Natasha married John Sally, yeah. a Detroit basketball player, Piston, in case you don't remember. <laughs> Some of you might not. That was a gift in itself. The truth had come out, and I didn't have to hide anymore. In 1969, Nat told me that he wanted to buy a flower shop. By this time, he was working for a florist. He started as a driver, and then he taught himself how to design. He used to go and ride in the trucks on delivery and take the arrangements apart and put them back together so he could teach himself. They didn't have floral schools back then. When he said he wanted to buy the shop, Byron's Flowers, 
I was hesitant. I said, Nat, you can design, but you've never managed a shop. And you only have a high school education. Mind you, he came here from the South. He ran away from his family because he couldn't take it down there. But he never went to college here. He just started working. But we bought the shop, and that was another gift. In January of next year, we have celebrated 50 years in business. In 1984, Nat had his first of seven strokes. He was only 44 years old when he had the first stroke. He went into a coma. He was paralyzed. And the doctors told us that he would be a vegetable for the rest of his life. Natasha didn't believe it. She didn't want to believe it. And every day after school, I would take the three kids to visit Nat. Natasha would sit at the foot of the bed and tickle his feet. There was no movement. Two and a half months later, one week before Christmas, Natasha tickled his feet. And he bolted up out of bed and said, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> We, we were so happy. <laughs> this was the best Christmas gift ever. After that, Nat nicknamed himself Nate the Great. Yeah. Looking back, 15 minutes... I thought had gone by since the robbers came into the store. So Nat and I came upstairs. Our son was just coming back into the store. We couldn't figure it out. He said that he had been in the bathroom the whole time that they were there. And when they left, he grabbed my husband's gun and ran after them. He spotted them running across Woodward and was getting ready to shoot, but decided that he might hit a pedestrian, so he didn't do it. Thank God that, they didn't, that he didn't come out during the robbery, and also that they just got our bank statement. Anyway, I was traumatized by the incident. We were on the news for a solid week. After all, our daughter had just married John Sally. <laughs> That's probably why they robbed us. They probably thought we had a lot of money. But anyway, for therapy, I decided that I would do something positive. So I started drawing portraits, big portraits, 30 by 40, portraits that filled the whole space of courageous black leaders. I drew Malcolm X, Mandela, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall, Martin Luther King, and Frederick Douglass. That was the beginning of my art career, where I would use my art to educate the world. I wanted to give out positive vibes for all this negativity that had taken place during the past week. Three years ago, I started another project. I started a book about Alzheimer's. By this time, Nat had developed the dementia that I noticed during the robbery many, many years prior. I took care of him at home for seven years, but after another massive stroke, the doctor said that he would, couldn't go back home that he'd have to be put into a, a nursing home. He never wanted to be in one, but by that time, he didn't even know where he was. For the next eight years, I watched him slowly die. And so 
I became so aware of the seven stages of the disease that I did seven drawings about each stage. And I wrote seven poems. I had never written poetry in my whole life. I wrote seven poems to accompany each drawing, expressing my feelings about what happens when someone you love gets this disease. I remember one day in the nursing home, a gentleman wheeled a lady in. And I went up to him and I said, is this a relative of yours? And what's wrong with her? He said, this is my mother and she has dementia, but she's gonna get better and she's gonna come home. I was stunned, in shock. He was in denial. And I said, we need to talk. And for the next three years, I would visit his mother during the week when he couldn't be there. And then on the weekend, I would tell him about her progress. And so I was educating him about the disease. My book about Alzheimer's with a picture of my husband, Nat, and the cover came out one month after his death. In January of this year, Nat suffered a grand mal seizure. And in order for it to stop after 20 minutes, Henry Ford Hospital had to paralyze him. I think that is when Nat actually physically and mentally passed. And at the end of that month, they told us it was time to let him go. It took us five months as a family to make that decision, but we finally did. He died one week before our 53rd wedding anniversary. And this is my gift from him to me. The courage to do what he did at such a young age to bring me happiness, to buy a flower shop, to raise our family, and to inspire me with our work, my art. And that's my goal in life now. That's my purpose in life, to go out and educate people about Alzheimer's. Nat was the best gift of my life. And on his tombstone grave, I have inscribed to my loving husband, Nate the Great. Pat Duff, sorry for your loss and thank you for your gift.